humpback whale, a true heavyweight of the sea. A colossal creature at up to 19 meters long and weighing up to 36 tons. But although its sheer size commands respect, its placid, peaceful nature and downright elegance are remarkable. Only a lucky few have ever come face to face with this gentle giant. It's a once in a lifetime experience. Adventure Ocean Quest. An encounter with a world under the waves. With divers who become underwater beings themselves. They work together with scientists on all the world's oceans. Deep under the surface of the water. Without a sound and without a breath. Adventure in the depths of the sea, the likes of which has never been seen before. The island of Rurutu in the South Pacific. An exceptional team of divers with a set of specialist skills is about to embark on a journey in the tracks of humpback whales. Their aim, to study the whales in an unusually intimate way. I think free diving is a very good way to explore the underwater world. And it's probably the, the less invasive way of exploring the underwater world. In spite of their massive size, whales are extremely shy animals and difficult to approach. Most people are only ever tolerated for a few seconds. There's still a lot to learn because we still have an estimation about 15,000 animals, maybe, humpbacks in, in the um, uh, South Hemisphere, but among them, only a few proportion has been identified with pictures. To explore their secret lives beneath the waves, it is essential to meet the whales in their element and on their terms. These whales are enormous. They're not small fish. They weigh 30 tons. That's a bit like an approaching bus. They are really majestic. Rurutu is a tiny island in the middle of the South Pacific. Discovered by James Cook in 1769, it now forms part of French Polynesia. Few visitors ever set foot on this isolated island, so its greatest asset is its unspoiled wilderness. Only seven kilometers long and three kilometers wide, it lies far off the main shipping routes. But it does lie right in the path of another very special route, the migration of the humpback whales. They were once hunted by the native peoples, but today, French Polynesia has been turned into a unique conservation area for marine mammals. Diving with conventional equipment is strictly prohibited here. It makes it an unusually safe and peaceful haven for the humpback whales. And this is where they come during the harsh winter months in their Antarctic feeding grounds. It is an epic annual trip of 7,000 kilometers. Although humpback whales tend to be loners, it is possible to find whole groups of them here. It is an ideal place for a whale nursery. The cows give birth to their calves in these warm, tropical waters. Here, their young are safe from deep-sea predators and protected from violent storms.
It is mid-September. The intense tropical colors typical of these South Pacific islands have vanished, and Rurutu is immersed in the threatening gray of a tropical storm. The weather is unusually unpredictable and threatening. It's been raining for days. The idea of spotting whales just off the shoreline remains a distant dream. These are bad conditions for the free divers Frédéric Bouilly and William Winram. Their expedition to find and catalog the whales could be in jeopardy. They're on their way to assist Cécile Gaspard, the founder of the Polynesian conservation organization Te Mana o Te Moana, or Spirit of the Ocean. Hello. Hello. Welcome to Polynesia. Ah. How are you? Beautiful weather. How was the trip? Good. Oh. Yeah, it's good weather. Tomorrow is better. <laughs> the weather forecasts are very vague. The team can only hope for the best. So we go tomorrow morning. Yes. The whales have been seen around, so uh -huh. we have a lot of luck. Good. And Great. so, cool. let's go. Okay. Cool. Ah, okay, Great. go. Okay. Finding the whales in the waters around Rurutu is usually not a problem, but they need better weather to conduct Cecile's study effectively. A lot of studies have been done on whales and other um, marine creatures for the past decade, and it's very interesting to get information. We know, the, for example, the whaling uh, has damaged a lot of this population, and we also know now, we've all studied, that the population is in a better shape. It starts to reproduce, and we hope this is going uh, on the good side, but we're not sure because there are so many changes in the world that maybe our hope right now is going to be completely different in a few years. The new kind of research we have been developing with Fred, going in the water with the whale and be very comfortable as a whale you know, in the water, is going to help us having new type of information and also share it with other people. And this is one of the key where if we could study uh, wildlife without too much interference, we may get more information, more accurate information without too much disturbance. And so we hope that this is a new step in, in research and that it could be maybe an example worldwide about how humans can use its ability to adapt to nature to better study it. Finding a whale requires discipline and patience. Since whales tend to keep their bodies mostly submerged, it means having to spot a whale's back as it's about to dive. Even better, is to search for the blow, the cloud of fine spray when the whale exhales on surfacing. Oh, the whale just blow behind us. But even once a whale is spotted, getting into the water with them and obtaining useful images is far from easy. The first thing is to locate the whale, since it's always in motion. When it's moving, it's tough to film it. So you have to wait until it finds a resting place. If you're watching a mother with her calf, you can wait until she feeds the baby. Then the whale will remain calm and still, and you can carefully enter the water. Right now, that's not possible. This whale is swimming around the island. It's moving, and we can't film it. The search for whales is tough and time-consuming. Even once a blow has been spotted, there's no guarantee that the whale will continue its travels in the same direction underwater. And actually getting into the water to attempt a closer encounter is only worth it when it's certain there's still a whale in the vicinity. The only option is to keep your eyes peeled and constantly evaluate the situation. But the team will also have to keep an eye on the tourist whale watching boats. The danger uh, when you are involved in ocean activities, it's always human. Uh, it's never the creature or the weather or anything. It's always human. And here the biggest problem is that we have like four boats around the whales. <laughs> so uh, you have to be very careful not to be run over by one of the boats. And uh, moreover, when a day like that with not a lot of sun, uh, all the colors are the same on, uh, on the water and our wetsuit are quite dark and uh, you have to be very careful. So that's why we have to spot each other with William uh, in order not to be run over. But the whale watchers give up. Fred and the team have more patience and continue their search. Finally, 
a humpback whale. The camera team gets ready. They will watch Fred from a distance. Diving is usually strictly prohibited in the area. The loud noise associated with conventional diving equipment agitates the animals. And since they're supposed to be left in peace to mate and raise their new calves, these disturbances are not tolerated. But the free diving team has special permission to observe the whales underwater. Free divers are different. They move silently through the water. Years of training allow them to spend several minutes at a time below the surface. They are perfect underwater observers. They can search for the whales without the help of noisy technology and wait patiently until an opportunity arises to get close to the animals. But the whales are very alert. Despite the free divers' utmost care, they soon put an end to their rest period and move on. The good news for the team is that they don't seem to be nervous. They even take the time to investigate the divers. It bodes well for any future encounters. Fred can clearly observe and document the unique patterns on the whale's delicate underside. Conditions improve. The weather gradually clears up. But for now, the team's luck has run out and they don't spot any more whales. Fred and Will decide to find out more about the indigenous population who used to hunt whales around the island. Perhaps they can shed some light on the best places to find the whales. They visit the caves in which the original inhabitants lived and from where they would look out for passing whales. The steep cliffs provided not only protection but also a good vantage point to scan the sea. Calm and protected bays allowed them to go out to sea even in rough weather. But reaching the caves is anything but easy and involves traversing difficult terrain. The caves themselves are also dangerous. Without a guide, it's easy to get lost in this underground network of chambers and tunnels. The native people had vantage points scattered across the island from where they could observe the whales. Rurutu's hills reach almost 400 meters above the sea level. There are no signposted paths up here. Time for a rest beneath some spectacular stalactites. Even today, there are still people on the island who remember the old whaling days and their ancestors' traditions. Fred has been told about Mama Paré, one of the oldest islanders. She's written a book about the history of Rurutu. Perhaps she can explain the whale's current elusiveness after their initial brief encounter. We've been here for several days already, and we still haven't come close to any whales. Are there years when there aren't any whales here? Toutes, après toutes les années, il y avait eu des baleines, mais on a entendu dire qu'on 
The whales come every year. American and Japanese whalers killed hundreds of them, so now we see a lot less of them than in the past. Now the fishermen have to go on long journeys. But usually you still see a lot of whales here. They amuse themselves. You can watch them from the beach as they jump out of the water. It's a disadvantage for you since you've not been allowed to hunt whales for years, but the Japanese still kill many. We caught one whale in 1930 and then the last one in 1957. That's over 20 years later. You didn't catch any whales for 20 years? No, not a single one. Do you think that they'll come back soon? There are some around. A few people saw one not long ago. They told us it was a mother with her calf. Fred has also been told about another sign of whale season on Urutu, and he decides to follow it up. It's the flowering of the whale tree. A fisherman takes Fred to this special tree. So the tree is in full bloom at the beginning of the whale season. Yes, that's when it's covered in blossoms. When it begins to flower, it means that the whales have arrived. That's when the whaling season starts. That's right. And what happens when the trees finish flowering? That's when the whales have gone. So we may have come at the end of the season. Yes. If this bit of local folklore is correct, the team has come here at the right time. But then there's another setback. Sirens sound an alarm. There's been a fax from Papeete, the capital of Polynesia. It's a tsunami warning. Nobody seems to have concrete information. The team desperately tries to find out more. I'm in contact with France. It's possible this is the last chance to be in touch before the tsunami hits. They know that we're taking all necessary precautions to evacuate people. So we stay here until it arrives? I guess. See what it looks like. The island's shoreline is quickly evacuated. Technical equipment is packed and everyone hastily retreats to higher ground. The wait begins. The tsunami hits Samoa and kills 120 people, but it doesn't reach Hurutu. The island has a lucky escape. For the expedition, the first few days on the island have been very disappointing. So when a call from Dr. Michael Poole, a humpback whale expert on Moria, reaches a dive team, they're quick to take up the opportunity. Dr. Poole would be interested to meet them. Moria is one of the society islands, 600 kilometers to the northeast of Uruto. Its bigger neighbor is Tahiti. It is located right in the heart of the conservation area for marine mammals that was established in 2002. Lush vegetation and high trees cover the island, and imposing volcanic peaks rise up from the sea. It is the essence of tropical tranquility. The bright turquoise bays with their deep, clear waters are lined with a protective fringe reef that reaches right around the island. Dr. Poole has been based here for the last 15 years. He is the director of the Marine Mammal Research Program at the Island Research Center and Environmental Observatory. He's one of the driving forces behind the setup of the whale and dolphin sanctuary. Every time we find an answer or partial answer to one question, there are five other questions that pop up. And some basic things that we do not know. How do whales navigate? We don't know. 
How do they find their breeding ground? How do they find their feeding ground? 7,000 kilometers distance between Antarctica and here in Tahiti. And how do they undertake that migration and find, we find some of the same whales coming back different years to the same island. How do they do that? We don't know. Um, the song of the humpback whales, the males that sing the song, what is it really for? We have different hypotheses, but no one is totally sure really what's going on. Why does the song change during a season and over years? Why does the song evolve over time? We don't know this at all. And so we're searching every day we're out, every week we're out, every month and over years to tr try to find answers to these questions. Myself, my colleagues, our students, all trying to find answers to these questions. We've never lost that fascination because there's so much that we don't understand. And another reason why you and your ability to dive deeply and stay long is valuable to our research is that you can photograph the underside of the individual or the side of the individual. And with your photographs, we can sex the individual. Free diving has a long tradition in Tahiti. Both fishermen and pearl divers have used the technique for hundreds of years. Local knowledge is always invaluable, and the Tahitian free diver Matana Taimana accompanies Fred on his next dive. On the way, she has a chance to show Fred a very special local attraction, stingrays that show no fear of humans. Christian Petron gets his equipment ready. The stingrays are already waiting right under the boat. Due to the venomous barbs on their tails, they have a reputation as lethal marine creatures, but here, they're at ease and don't pose a significant threat. Elegantly gliding through the water, the rays live up to their docile reputation and don't respond nervously to the divers. But to find humpback whales, the divers have to leave these shallow waters. The tireless search for the whales begins again. Dr. Poole doesn't usually work with divers. He tends to watch and identify the animals from the surface using a catalog of photographs. Humpback whales have completely individual tail fins distinct both in shape and coloration. Occasionally, the whales give spectacular, even acrobatic performances. They emerge from the water and thrash the surface with their tail fins. These may be attempts to rid themselves of irritating parasites. The energetic spectacle means that fragments of whale skin come loose, which the scientists quickly gather from the water. It allows them to analyze the animal's DNA. Over time, they can piece together a more and more detailed description of each individual. Fred prepares for a dive. Should a whale approach, he has to be ready. Christian is only too aware that it will take a bit of luck to get the chance to film Fred near the whales. It can mean hours of waiting, ready to get in the water in minutes. 
patience is one of the absolute requirements to make it as a wildlife filmmaker. Then they're in luck. They spot a whale cow with her calf. They seem to be resting near the surface. There's no time to lose. Fred always makes the first explorative dive on his own. By the time the other divers manage to reach the required depths, the whale may have already moved on. This time, luck is on their side. The whale calf is not at all shy, even playful, while its mother is having a rest further down. It's a one-off chance for a close encounter. The divers have to be very careful. Even a calf's tail fin could wreak havoc. But this intimate meeting of the whale baby and the free diver is over all too soon. The mother eventually intervenes, and the two majestic marine mammals move on. But then Fred spots another opportunity. A school of pilot whales passes nearby. For a few minutes, Fred can swim alongside them. Pilot whales are being followed. An oceanic white tipped shark is on their tails. This is a formidable predator, reaching around three meters in length. But the whales are safe in its company. Oceanic white tipped sharks are often found in the company of pilot whales, although the reason for this association is not fully understood. It's a breathtaking experience for Fred. For a few seconds, a few minutes, I'm really part of the environment as one of the habitants of that environment. I try not to bring my human abilities with me, but try really to forget about them, bury them somewhere in my brain, and just being like an animal or part of the area I'm diving. Free diving allows you to do that. And as Fred becomes one with his environment, the animals he encounters seem to perceive him as one of them. He can witness their behavior in an entirely different way. Tracking whales is laborious and time-consuming, but there are some shortcuts. Sometimes it's possible to hear these giants before you see them. And Fred's luck hasn't run out yet. Photographs like these can only be taken underwater. They're a very welcome addition to the whale researcher's catalog. So maybe we can talk about the, this mark? No? Yeah. That's really pretty, Fred. I mean, from an aesthetic viewpoint, it's absolutely yeah. beautiful. Nice marks. 
Yes. And look how these throat plates bifurcate. Can you go backwards just a second? Right here, splitting into two. Indeed, allowing more spread, more expansion as it takes in water and food. Very, very nice. These detailed photographs of the whale's unique markings are invaluable to Dr. Poole's research. Working from the boat, he would normally be unable to take any pictures as detailed as these. We can actually identify whales, not only by their tails, not only by their dorsal fins, we can identify them by their pleats. They are different for every individual. Great photograph, Fred. Yeah, truly, really nice. Right. But Fred soon has to return to Rurutu to continue his original mission. It isn't looking positive. Will has told him that the team still haven't managed to sight any whales. This is highly unusual for this time of year. Normally, there are always several whale groups in the area. Could there be a connection with the disturbance of the storms or the tsunami? Not a blow anywhere to be seen. A frustrating wait for the divers. Nothing yet. In the past, they had sometimes a period of one week to 10 days with no animals because they go to other islands. Okay. So uh, hopefully it's the case and they yeah. just left for one week or so, but still it's uh, apparently like eight days now they haven't yeah. seen a whale. Uh, we have to keep our fingers crossed and hope for the best. Fred tries to stay optimistic. He knows only too well the value of his abilities to a mission like Cecile's. The best example of the, the difference between scuba diving and free diving uh, is that, for example, in many places, it's forbidden to scuba dive with the animals, like whales, dolphins, sharks, or even reefs. And uh, the scientists understood that it's disturbing a lot. Most of the time, free diving is allowed. Uh, for example, here in Rorotu, you cannot uh, scuba dive with the whales, but you can free dive. With free diving, you don't disturb them as much. But of course, with free diving, you can also disturb whales. Right? It doesn't mean you're just uh, part of the water and they don't notice you. But uh, the general disturbance is smaller with free diving. But you still have to be careful when you approach them, uh, to approach them from front, not from behind, otherwise they feel you and they go away and try always to be in their field of vision. Uh, it's not because you're a free diver that you can uh, go everywhere and do whatever you want. You still have to keep an ethic to your work and the way you, you work with animals. It's not, uh, uh, I would say, a general visa, being a free diver. You still have to, to be careful. The team continues their efforts. Again, the boat is loaded with equipment and supplies. They're committed to their mission. But for Cecile, too, time is running out. She's expected back on Morea. So Christian wants to try a different tactic to track down the whales. He has a special hydrophone, a microphone for underwater recordings. Encased in a watertight housing, this highly sensitive microphone registers sound waves underwater and records them. Christian's plan is to listen for signs of the whales just like on Morea. And if you can hear a whale, you can also find it. Today, conditions at least are very favorable. 
the visibility is good and the sea relatively calm. Fred and Will get into position in the water. Christian lets the hydrophone drift around 10 meters below the surface. And the tactic seems to be working. They pick up some interesting sounds. And these are special. They clearly originate from a whale. The problem is to work out the direction from which the sounds are coming. Finally, success. They've come across a singer. Whales take up a particular position in the water when they're about to sing. They remain motionless in the water column, head down and fins outstretched. Underwater, it's actually possible to feel the powerful sound waves. The exact method of generating the sounds is unclear. Unlike land animals, the whales don't exhale while producing them. It's possible they manage to recycle air within their bodies to continue their songs without having to breathe. For the divers, this encounter with a singing humpback whale was a first real success in their mission near Rurutu. They return to dry land and prepare to brief Cecile in the evening with precious underwater images as well as observations of the behavior witnessed. Male humpback whales sing during the mating season. It's possible they're trying to attract a mate with their serenades. But their songs could also serve to keep potential rivals at bay. Studies have shown that different whale populations have their own distinct songs. The tunes the males produce are complicated and travel for hundreds of kilometers underwater. The different sounds combine to produce individual verses, which are repeated in a particular order and are constantly developed further. Cecile explains to Fred why she is so interested in more information about the whales. What is your hope for the future? So I think even if we fear there has been very good action in the past. We still need to go and do more, and we need to go very fast. So I think whales are very appealing to people. And if really there is a message that whales are uh, still threatened by all the human activity, even if it's not hunting, but now it's pollution and global warming, then we hope that these people may be more sensitive to react. We also found that when people had um, close contact with a wild animal, they feel they know this animal better, they feel it different way, and when they come back home, they are like, okay, now maybe I'm going to recycle my trash. So we try. The divers are eager to continue their work the next day, but they don't get very far. The engine breaks down. Without engine power, the boat drifts helplessly and threatens to run aground on the reef. They have to abandon their whale search before it even started. The priority now is to call a rescue boat. Can you use that, please? Attention à déborder. Préparez-vous à déborder. 
They've been lucky to escape with no further damage. But it's a further disappointment. For today, they're unable to start another excursion. Fred and Will try to spend their time usefully and visit the next village to stock up on supplies. Around lunchtime, after school, the place comes alive with young people. People are very friendly here at Rural 2. You see it's a very small island, so everybody knows each other. When you walk in the street, uh, people say hi. Uh, everybody is really friendly. You can go everywhere. They give you fruit from the garden. You can ask them to pick up fruit from the garden if you need. Uh, people are so friendly. Other than exuberant wilderness, Rural 2 doesn't have much to offer its visitors. The villages are not packed with tourist attractions, but customs have to be kept alive in traditional crafts which are one of the main forms of income for the islanders. But there are one or two surprises in store for the divers. Rutu also has French roots after all. The divers need to have a high calorie intake and they found just the place to get them. I did not expect to find this on this really? small remote island. No. Mm. You know, it's French Polynesia. They have some traditions. Oh. oh. Mm. Wow. While their boat is being repaired, they can only wait and watch while others demonstrate their diving prowess. A new day brings fresh hope, but although the sun's out, diving conditions are bad. The divers want to reach the open sea through a pass in the island's fringe reef. There are only a handful of these gates in the reef. Things aren't going to plan. With the condition today, there's no way the boat can pick you up on no, the other side. No, no, no. It's too rough. It's way too rough. For us, conventional divers, big waves aren't a problem. We can dive under them. But for the free divers, it's impossible because they get overrun by the waves and can't prepare their dives. Even the stunning South Pacific beaches are no consolation. The divers are again forced to wait until wind and waves calm down. Eventually, they're able to try their luck once again. This time, the start is more promising. Now they have to follow the whales. A last equipment check. They've managed to find a whale cow with her calf. They're an ideal target for the divers, since the pair will definitely have a rest period at some point. The divers continuously check that they haven't lost the whales.
They don't want to take any chances and miss their long-awaited chance of a close encounter with the whales of Rurutu. Finally, things seem to be going their way. They can risk approaching the animals face to face underwater. The whale mother remains motionless in the depths, resting. Floating upright in the water column, her eyes lifted towards the surface, she keeps an eye on her baby. The calf is very curious, playful and exuberant. Although still a baby, it is already an enormous animal and dwarfs Fred. It seems curious about this silent intruder into its underwater world and shows no signs of nervousness. On this occasion, Fred has enough time to watch the animal closely and catalog its distinctive marks in detail. It's a unique and rare opportunity to meet these mysterious creatures on their own terms and in their own element before finally it's time for the mother and calf to move on. This mission turned out to be no easy task for Fred and the team, but despite all the setbacks, they've been successful in delivering some important underwater images of the Rurutu whales. They will provide valuable information and identification clues for the researchers. These are the, the pictures I took the other day of the mother and calf. The calf was very playful. He, it was, we had to be, be careful because it was really like a little kid, a yeah. little pup. He didn't know where to put his fin, so we had to be careful. So you have a very good access to the belly. Yes. You know? And yes. so this is a very distinctive mark that will grow with the animal, mm -hmm. of course. Um, did you get an estimation of the size? Uh, the size, one? I think it was around six meter long. Okay. It's, it was young, but uh, from this year for sure, yeah, but yeah. Uh, maybe one, one and a half months okay. old okay. already. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. just not a newborn. Huh? Okay. So, you know, Fred, this is very important because this kind of, of marks on the skin that are so distinctive and so impressive, they are going to stay all the life. Mm -hmm. So this animal, if it's seen in one month, two months, 10 years, 20 years, maybe 40 years, you can tell this is the that same animal I spotted by you in Rutu this yeah. year. So that's very interesting. Maybe during my next trip to Antarctica, I might yeah. bump into that whale again. Exactly, so this is how it's very important for not only researchers, but tourists and any people that have access to whales and, and, and take pictures, to be able to download the pictures to this very extensive catalog. And then if you have specific mark like that, uh, or natural mark like that, they should be uh, labeled mm -hmm. so people could find them again. Yes, I'm always happy when uh, one of my pictures can be used for something else than just being a picture. Uh, if it can help and improve the, the knowledge about these animals, it's it's great. It's uh, great. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a, a great picture, you know, but it will be also used but by. That was really people. fascinating by the, the pattern of the that oh, birthmark. It's just uh, I've never seen that before. Part of the fascination people seem to have developed for the whales here 
must surely also lie with their exotic summer territories, the South Pacific. What we find here in islands like Rorotu, it's, uh, it's the Pacific Islands 150 years ago. For me, the unpacked whales are the most fascinating whales because every year they do thousands and thousands of kilometers to go from their feeding ground in Antarctica back here in the South Pacific Island to rest and mate and have the babies and then go all the way back with the newborn babies in the feeding ground of Antarctica. And that's a mystery because they do this very, very dangerous journey twice a year. It's fascinating to watch them, how they move in the water. Um, it's also, it's awe-inspiring to, to feel so small. When you're next to uh, an enormous whale, you feel tiny. And sometimes when uh, I'm freediving with a whale here in Rorotu, uh, when they sleep, they lay at <clears throat> 25 meters, I look at, at the whale and I say, yeah, oh, that's a wonderful life. It's a whale therapy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah. It's true. I mean, all your problem disappears when you see a creature like that because it's so big, it's there for like thousands and thousands of years. It's, it's just perfect creature and, uh, and peaceful. And uh, after spending time with them, yeah, you, you change, for sure, you change. By themselves, they, they can change you from inside. They can really do that.